we'll end this uh, time of centering with a meta meditation. Uh, repeat after me if you choose to. May I be free from danger. May I be mentally happy. May I be physically happy. May I have ease of well-being. The second time we're going to say it for somebody that we love. May you be free from danger. May you be mentally happy. May you be physically happy. May you have ease of well-being. And this last time we say it from somebody we have a resentment with. Don't look around. <laughs> May you be free from danger. May you be free from danger. May you be mentally happy. May you be mentally happy. May you be physically happy. May you be physically happy. May you have ease of well being. I want to do a special prayer out for Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Vinman, and I hope that one of the rich um, Democratic billionaires gives him a job. Ashe. Amen. Blessed be. All right. Now I get to talk to you. So uh, the sermon today is called Adventures in Hymnody. Now, hymnody is, might be a word you're not familiar with, but basically it's the study of hymns or sacred music or church music. Um, hymn just means a song of praise um, in the way that psalm means a song of praise. Uh, and it's usually associated with church music, but there are hymns in every religion and every practice. Um, have you ever wondered about the words and stuff in your hymnal you might want to get a gray hymnal to talk about this today like i thought we'd just talk about something that usually is not talked about so like why do we sing the songs we sing in the way that we sing them and who thought that up like what's the difference between sacred and secular music like who decides what's what like, can we have Florence on the Machine in church? Is that okay? Or is that not okay? And people disagree about this stuff. They disagree about it to the point that it split churches. Whether you could clap in church or not. Or whether you clap on one and three or two and four. Do you know what I mean? Okay. Um, if you're having a real solemn event, do you sing the song slower to be more reverent? Or do you sing them with as much heart as you can and as much rowdiness as you can? So the most, as much emotion as you can. All these things have to do with what tradition you were brought up in, what your economic class and your race was. Because it differs. And so Unitarian Universalism comes out of a particular tradition. I'm going to talk about that. But when we, when we first start having Christians, they are all Jews. And their, their religious practices were very similar. So the music that they did was out of the Jewish tradition. Now, in the Jewish tradition, you have rabbis who talk to the people and wrestle with the scripture. And you have the cantor who sings and wrestles with the scripture. And does all those things that a rabbi does, but they sing. And God only listens to the cantor in the Jewish tradition. Did you know that? So when in the early church, the music was Im imitated the Jewish traditions. And there's other things about the Jewish tradition. Because Jews were surrounded by people of all different kind of pagan faiths. Zoroastrian. Um, all, is, you know, Islam's not really happening. But... Um, other things are happening. And so the way that a lot of pagan traditions, they had a lot of dancing and they had a lot of instruments and people were very, you know, a lot of percussion. And so one of the ways that the Jews could separate themselves from that was to not use those instruments. Now in the Old Testament, they talk about using instruments and they had the Psalms, which are 150 Psalms in the Old Testament that were supposedly written by King David. I don't think it's true. I think people, 
that didn't have a lot of social power wrote the songs and King David said, yeah, that's my song. I paid for it. It's mine. But King David was a musician. He played the lyre. It's like a harp. Um, okay. So we have the Psalms. We have Jewish tradition. And as uh, Paul and the Gentiles came into Christianity, then people brought their musical styles in as well. But for the most part, the early church did pl what they call plain chant and Gregorian chant. And it's very a cappella. Everybody sings together. There's one syllable per note. What do I mean? Everything I say and everything you say has a beat. Get it? <laughs> so they call that hymn meter. It's real important to almost everything we're going to talk about today. Uh, say Amazing Grace is a very famous hymn. Everybody knows the words too, I think. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. Eight. That saved a wretch like me. Six. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Eight. Was blind, but now I see. Six. Eight dot six dot eight dot six. Another song that has that is called Joy to the World. You know that song, Christmas song? Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Eight, six. They call that common meter. When it has eight, the first line has eight syllables. The second line has six. And so if you look in, your, in a gray hymnal to page uh, 664, in the back on the bottom, it's going to say the numbers, not the reading numbers. It's in the back, and it's, it says hymn meter index. Raise your hand real quick when you found it so I know that you've got it. You have to, you have to look at the bottom of the page for the numbers at the back. It's, al it's almost at the very back of the hymnal. What was the number again? 664. Metrical index. Yeah, it says hymn met metric Index, hymn meter index. Found it? Okay, if you notice there, the second thing listed, it says CM 8.6.8.6, common meter. Now, we already know two songs by heart that are in that meter, Amazing Grace and Joy to the World. But what you may not know is that people did not put the tunes in hymnals until 1831. So before that, if you were from a Calvinist tradition, I'll talk about that in a minute, then you followed, uh, you followed, you only sang the Psalms and your psaltery, which is, which had it in the language that you were singing in. So if you were like John Calvin and you were French, you sang in French, or if you were German like Martin Luther, you might sing in German or English, like the pilgrims, our, our Unitarian ancestors. They sang out of a, a hymnal that had been written in English by this guy, guy named Arms, Armsworth. And so his psaltery is called the Armsworth Psaltery, and that's what the pilgrims carried over on the Mayflower. And it only had the words and the hymn meter listed. So you sang it to the tunes you knew. So say you only knew the tune to Amazing Grace, you would sing Joy to the World like this. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Because that's the only tune you knew that worked with that hymn meter. Okay, that's weird. Why, do, why is that? Well, people didn't move around very much. They might spend their whole life within 10 miles of where they were born. So, and they might not have pianos. I mean, like most people were traveling in wagons. You didn't carry around a big piano on a wagon, right? So you had to sing a cappella a lot. You had to, you had to get by with a, just a guitar. That's what people did. And so they sang the tunes that they knew to the hymn meters. And it's still in every hymnal, no matter what tradition you come from. This, this kind of stuff is in there. So if you turn to page 245, that's Joy to the World in the regular hymnal. 
and look at the bottom of the page. Every single hymn in the hymnal will tell you who wrote it. If somebody rewrote it, which is very common in Unitarian Universalism, and who wrote the tune, that's all on the left. On the right, it says in capital letters, Antioch. What's that, Kaya? Well, if it's all in capital letters, that's the name that they call that particular tune. And there's an index of that in the back. So the tune that we sing Joy to the World is is called Antioch. And then underneath it, it says C.M, which means common meter. Common meter is 8.6. 8.6. So what that tells you is that you could look in the hymn meter thing and see what, what words match that hymn meter. And then you could sing it to whatever tune that you knew. So you can sing Joy to the World to Amazing Grace. Joy, joy to the world or Amazing Grace to Antioch. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. <laughs> you can also sing it too. Other songs that work with common meter are uh, The House of the Rising Sun works, and so does uh, Gilligan's Island. <laughs> Amazing grace, what so is the sound that saved a wretch like me? I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. <laughs> this, is our, this is our history. This is our heritage. So there's two guys we really got to talk about right away. That's Martin Luther, who started Lutheranism, Protestantism. We all come from Martin Luther. So Martin Luther was a Dominican priest, and he... Um, was very upset about many things, specifically indulgences and the Roman Catholic Church selling them. And so he started complaining about that. But he was a musician. He was a trained musician. He played the lute, which is very similar to the guitar. And he, um, he was brilliant in that he really believed that congregants should sing. In the Catholic Church, like the Jewish Church, the music was for God and not for you. You're lucky that you got to be there, and you're lucky that you got to take communion. You wretch. (laughs) So music wasn't for you. But Luther did not think that. Luther thought that we were saved by grace, that God saved us. We had, you know, we we were sinners, so we couldn't do we couldn't make it happen. Right? But we could sing, and we could sing together in community. Congregational singing was big to him. Here's where he was a genius. He took German soldier songs and turned them into the tunes because everybody knew them from singing in the bar. They knew the tunes already. And so he wrote hymns. He wrote about 70, some people say 80, hymns. One of them that's in our hymnal is A Mighty Fortress is Our God, which I think is at 200. Martin Luther wrote both the music and the words. In German, they would have originally sang it in German. And so, and the tune is a, is a marching song, soldier song. Everybody knew. So everybody could sing. And that was his big innovation. And another innovation was that the service would be in the vernacular, so in his case, German. And so the Bible got translated into German. People started reading it for themselves. It was much more about the individual person's relationship with God. So the music changes, and you need one note per meter, one note per syllable, because that makes it easy to sing together, right? We can sing together. Cool, right? So he he was he lived from fourteen eighty three to fifteen forty six. Now the reason I love him is because um, he said it was perfectly all right for clergy to get married. <laughs> I think he would be freaked out that I married a girl, but otherwise, it was all good. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's 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 Martin Luther. Lutheranism comes from that. Anglicans come from that. Uh, Episcopal people come from that. Methodist people come from that. Uh, Baptist people. Anybody who thought music was a gift from God, they believed in instruments. They believed in trained music leaders. <laughs> And choirs, they would pay their people to be in their choir. They were like professional choir people. There were organs, there were pianos, you know, later. Pianos are later. So 
Anyway, the point is, if you grew up in that tradition, raise your hand. Any of those traditions. Okay, you were exposed to a lot of music, right? You didn't just sing songs. Now, the other guy who was very influential on this deal, it's a little bit younger than, than Luther, but uh, was John Calvin. And he was born in 1509 and lived to 1564. French. Both these guys get excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church. John Calvin is my least favorite person in theology. <laughs> um, he, here's all you need to know about John Calvin. John Calvin was eating dinner. The person across from him. Everybody's having soup. Soup and bread. Homemade bread. Tell me, right? The person who was eating the soup across from him was enjoying their soup a little too much for John. So he poured cold water in their soup because the things of the world distract you from heaven. From getting to heaven. Music could distract you. And he's not alone in that belief. Where that first starts is with Augustine of Hippo, St. Augustine, people call him. Um, Northern African. Uh, he was pagan and got saved, became a Christian like his mother. And um, he wrote a book called Confessions. And he says in that book, where I think Calvin got the idea, let's see. The weaker mind may be stimulated to devout thoughts by the delights of the ear. Yet when I happen to be moved more by the singing than by what is sung, I confess to have sinned grievously. So about that point is when you start having secular music, sacred music. Never the twain should meet. But it's just a guy and just his own struggle. It's not. We don't have to continue to believe it, but we know, don't need to know where it comes from. Now, if you're a Unitarian Universalist and you will raise that, raise your hand. Okay, Nell. Nell. <laughs> <laughs> Unitarian Universalism was Calvinist originally. The pilgrims were Unitarian. Okay? So they only sang the songs. They had their psaltery. They learned their one tune for common meter, one for short meter, one for long meter, and that's what they sang to. Go to page 18 in the hymnal. The great thing about a free pulpit is that I can tell you my opinions, and you can tell where I come from um, by what I think about this stuff. Now, on page 18 is what wondrous love is this. Do you know this song? What wondrous love is this that made my heart such bliss? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, look at the bottom of that one. And it says Southern Harmony. It's a traditional folk tune, which means probably a woman wrote it or somebody black. They say Anonymous wrote it. Okay, so the Southern Harmony was published in 1835. It was the best seller in 1835, it sold a million copies. And it was. A shape note hymnal. There, if anybody ever sang shape note to me? Okay. For those y'all don't know, shape note was an early American form of singing, and they had singing schools. People like me would go around and they'd come to your church for a week and they'd teach everybody how to read shape note. It's kind of like reading music, but it's a little easier than traditional uh, Western notes. So basically there's four shapes and then they would have the notes so you could tell what the rhythm was. And the shapes matched the syllables in solfege. Anybody ever sang, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do? Right? That comes from Guido. He was a, he was a monk and the paper was real expensive then, right? So he's running a choir and he could point to a place in his hand and you would sing do, which was C. Re, do, a, D, et cetera, up through a major scale. Major scale it sounds happy, right? Do re mi fa so la ti do. And shape notes in it. It's fa so la fa so la mi fa. Fa is a triangle, and so is the circle. And la is a square. And mi, which only happens once, is a diamond. So you can learn to read music really, really fast. And people all. We're participants, so it's congregational singing, a cappella, four parts. 
So it's got sopranos and altos and tenors and bass. And the melody is in the tenor. So if you look on the right hand side page of Wondrous Love, that version has the melody in the tenor, and that's a traditional state note. But it's written in, in Western notation, which is what people learned. And there's a reason for that. So in the 1700s, when the Revolutionary War happened, the most popular composer in America was a guy named William Billy. He's got some songs on the hymn. Um, his, the most popular song in Revolutionary War was Chester, a song called Chester. And uh, he taught himself. And he learned that shape note song. He was a song teacher. So he'd go around and teach people, and everybody in the congregation, like, imagine that you all like, like singing. Imagine that you like it. Imagine that you sang from the bottom of your feet as loud as you could so that God could hear you. And somebody stood in the middle and kept time like this. They weren't conducting like this. They were conducting like this. Just keeping the time. What wondrous love is this that made my heart so I don't know the You got the idea? Yep. And you'd sing all the way out. Bright morning star rising. Bright morning star rising. Like that. And the whole building would shake. It's beautiful singing. If you ever get a chance to do it, I highly recommend it. But we had a Unitarian dude named Lowell Mason who was for money, and he had been trained to be a classical composer. So he learned that German, European style of writing notes. So do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, go, with five lines and dots, treble clef and bass clef. Okay? That kind of writing. Lowell Mason thought that if Americans were ever going to be equal to the Europeans, they had to learn that. And so he put it in public school education. But he didn't just stop there. He went, that American kind of singing, that shape note singing, that's bad. Only ignorant, hillbilly kind of people like myself. I'll do that kind of thing. So it fell out of paper. And now there's, there's still shape note singing all over the world, you can find out. There's a website called fossillaw.org, and you can look there and see if there's a saying here near Amarillo. I'm sure there is. Once a month, twice a month, sometimes. In the Austin area, there's tons of them. And they have a big uh, festival every year. But if you've never participated in that kind of singing, I highly recommend you go do it. It's the most democratic thing that you've ever seen. And people it never make you feel stupid for not knowing how. They pitch between two people who know how to do it. And they would teach you. So don't don't be afraid to try it. Anyway, but that's why we don't sing that way anymore. Unless you're from the South, mostly. There are still, a, or you're from a primitive, um, primitive Baptist sing shape note. Uh, Church of Christ people sometimes sing shape note. Um, but the book hasn't really changed since the 1835 book came out, Southern Harmony. So. Who who wrote the hymnal? How do, why are the songs in the hymnal that are in the hymnal? Anybody know? Ministers. Ministers and music people, they make a committee every 20, 25 years, and they decide what's going to be in the hymnal. So our hymnal that we have right now, that gray one, is about 20 years old. Mark Bellatini, who is a famous minister who's now retired, was the Columbus, Ohio minister, but he was also in California. He was the head of the committee. He's an opera aficionado. He's not a trained musician, necessarily. Um, how many people think the hymnal is really hard to sing? <laughs> it's, it's, if you're a first soprano or a tenor, it's not hard. But if you're an alto or a bass or a lower tenor, it's hard to sing. That's a shame. Yeah. A good music director can change the scale so that more It's just a thing that happened. Uh, Mary Gregolia, who wrote uh, I Know This Rose Will Open, she was also on that committee that decided what's in the hymn. A lot of baby boomer songs in the hymn, because that's what they were. You know, there's a reason why all the Pete Seeger songs were in the hymn, or Holly Near, or you see what I'm saying? But it's human beings that do it. And the older hymnals, from like the Civil War area era, there were two ministers that had gone to Harvard. One of them uh, was was the brother of Henry Longfellow, 
Samuel and his friend Johnson, and they they actually did the main hymnal that has had the longest life. And there are a lot of songs in our hymnal that came from that. So somebody makes a hymnal, it gets to, you know goes for twenty years or so, and then somebody <coughs> makes another one, and they keep the songs that people like, and they get rid of the songs they don't, and they move on. So it's almost time for a new hymnal. So if you don't like the music, change it. They usually have a contest. You can write songs too. If you're interested in learning to write hymns, I would look at the hymn meters and try to emulate, try to write new words for hymns you already know and see if you get better at it. Because usually the problem is that you don't make it beat correct. Like by that I mean, you can say hello like hello, or you can say hello, right? So if you want to write new words, they need to beat the same way. So how many people have been singing a you, you, him, and you get to the third verse and you can't sing it? <laughs> Most of the hymns have been written by ministers and they don't necessarily know how to write. They have the theology right, but they don't have the beat and the meter. So something to pay attention to. So here's the, here's the part that's a little hard to hear about what I'm going to say. All right. Everybody grew up in a different church. How many people think it's okay to clap in church? How many people think it's terrible, anathema, never should happen? Okay. Churches have split over this. But here's the thing. If we want diversity in the church, we need people that are happy about the music at least part of the time. And not everybody likes classical music. I know this is hard for some people, especially Unitarians, to hear. But classical music is not the favorite music of everyone. Nor do we think it's better. You know, uh, I get away with this because I went to music school. And so I had to learn classical music. But I don't believe that it's actually better music. I think it's just as good as take notes or pop or rock or jazz. You know, they're all music to me. That's why I can play the game. Because <clears throat> I'm not taught, I'm not in that tied to written music thing. But that, that is a very unusual position to be in. But the part that you need to hear is that if you want your church to be diverse, you need to not like the music part of the time, maybe a third. And allow there to be room so that everybody's comfortable in your congregation. And that's how you get diversity. Because music is just as important as preaching. It has theology underneath. Thank you so much for listening.